Welcome to the third and final part of our virtual tour on the history of science in Oxford. We are at the heart of Oxford um, in Radcliffe Square and this is perhaps the most beautiful building of Oxford University known as Radcliffe Camera. Camera is translated from Italian as a room. So who was John Radcliffe? Uh, uh, John Radcliffe um, became a student um, at University College uh, at the age of 13, although according to the records uh, he was uh, 15. Uh, and uh, uh, he rose to prominence as a doctor uh, to William III, Queen Mary, Queen Anne, and his, as his contemporaries uh, uh, wrote uh, sarcastically that uh, he was an expert in the diseases of rich people. Mm -hmm. uh, later he became a fellow uh, at Lincoln College, uh, um, but uh, had to resign because he didn't want to take uh, uh, holy orders um, as it was a uh, custom in those days. Um, and in his will, he left uh, his uh, legacy um, uh, to the trust. Um, and that's why we now have uh, Radcliffe Camera, we have um, uh, Radcliffe Observatory, we used to have Radcliffe Infirmary, there is a Radcliffe Ward um, uh, in uh, University College and of course John Radcliffe Hospital. Uh, this is still the library. Initially it was uh, also designed uh, as a library uh, to contain books on natural history and medicine. Uh, later uh, when the books were moved to a new library, uh, that very library uh, was named uh, Radcliffe Science Library. And uh, underneath uh, there are reading rooms uh, and stacks of books. John Radcliffe um, is buried um, at University Church uh, as a doctor and great benefactor to the university. And this is a plaque which says that John Radcliffe uh, is actually buried here in the University Church. Radcliffe Observatory quarter of the university and one of the landmarks uh, is Radcliffe um, Observatory uh, which used to be the astronomical observatory of Oxford University and it was completed at the end of the 18th century. It immediately became a center of scientific knowledge internationally and was designed and built to promote astronomy and navigation. In addition, on the grounds uh, of Green Templeton College uh, um, there is uh, also uh, the oldest meteorological station in the UK which has the records of temperature and rainfall uh, uh, since um, 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 a couple of centuries ago. It is the longest record um, for a single site in Britain running continuously from 1813 and the records themselves uh, uh, go backwards um, to the 18th century and uh, it is um, managed by the School of Geography and, and the Environment and at the moment uh, the station itself um, and it's still functioning. This is a little-known monument uh, to John Radcliffe um, next to Green Templeton College, next to the Radcliffe Observatory. It was unveiled um, um, a few years ago to commemorate uh, uh, 300th anniversary since his death. The Radcliffe Infirmary and County Hospital um, gave name to the whole area and many doctors initially volunteered they, um, uh, and uh, uh, they're living uh, with uh, private practice. Um,
So the Radcliffe Hospital um, was opened on St. Luke's Day in, in uh, 1770 and we have St. Luke's Chapel here now which is deconsecrated and used as a lecture hall at the moment. Um, uh, the Bishop of Oxford um, uh, consecrated uh, uh, the hospital and the congregation prayed uh, that the burial grounds which were also designed would be the only useless part of hospital. Um, uh, the hospital itself, it uh, didn't cater um, specifically for um, uh, different uh, specialities within medicine, uh, but uh, actually what we now know as uh, Warford Hospital, for example, it was initially established as uh, the Radcliffe Lunatic Asylum, um, and also the ophthalmology um, uh, clinic was also based here. And, uh, uh, this building, this is where um, the Department of Primary Care Health Sciences uh, is situated at the moment and uh, the Radcliffe Infirmary was um, uh, the first uh, to introduce uh, the Oxford Centre for Prevention in Primary Care uh, thus pioneering the concept of the human mot. Um, it's also interesting to note that it was the first um, provincial um, hospital which um, had an admissions um, office. And the first accident service in Great Britain also began here. The infirmary closed uh, in um, uh, 2007 and uh, the buildings uh, now uh, house uh, university facilities. But what the infirmary was also famous for was penicillin. Penicillin was first used to treat infection here in this very building. This was a case of a policeman who had some face infection and, uh, and uh, uh, the scholars, uh, the scientists, the doctors decided to uh, try uh, penicillin on him. Uh, he would have died otherwise. Um, they noticed immediately that it did, it did help, uh, uh, but they didn't have uh, enough amount of penicillin. They even tried to extract it from his urine. Uh, um, it, it didn't uh, work in the end because they didn't have enough and uh, he eventually died. But uh, that was the beginning of the revolutionary discovery that it died. The history of penicillin is quite complicated and Alexander Fleming, um, the most known name in this regard, uh, did not actually invent it. Um, he discovered that a mold um, on one of his culture plates uh, killed bacteria, but this achievement was not initially appreciated. And it took a few years um, uh, before a scientist at the Dunn School of Pathology uh, isolated and purified penicillin for clinical use. And now we are going to see the plaque commemorating these scientists. Flory and Chain, uh, they, uh, together with uh, Fleming, they were awarded um, the Nobel Prize um, in medicine in 1954 uh, and penicillin played a crucial role uh, during the Second World War in saving millions of lives. Um, uh, also interesting to note uh, that apparently in case of invasion uh, the scientists uh, had um, uh, bits of uh, penicillin uh, uh, on uh, their coat linings uh, so that uh, if they needed to escape, uh, uh, the culture could be restarted anywhere. Oxford has its own monument um, to those um, doctors and scientists uh, who worked on penicillin and uh, who discovered the clinical importance of penicillin. And it is situated in the Rose Garden next to the Oxford University Botanic Garden. Um, and uh, on the monument itself, you can actually see the names uh, of all those um, workers in the university who were involved, not only those who were awarded the Nobel Prize. So 
the Mathematical Institute is named uh, after Professor Andrew Wiles, um, who is a fellow at Merton College, and uh, he is also an alumnus of Merton College. Uh, he is famous for approving uh, Fermat's last theorem, and he was awarded um, the Abel Prize uh, for his contribution. And next uh, to the Mathematical Institute uh, is um, this uh, piece of art, uh, which uh, is a tree which symbolizes uh, um, interdisciplinary research, growth, inspiration and a quest for knowledge. Um, and uh, you can see um, some metallic banners with inscriptions uh, from uh, um, the d different departments uh, based on the research which is carried out there. And the crown reference is an illustration uh, from Solomon Trismazin's manuscript, Splendor Solis, which is a famous treatise on alchemy from the 16th century. And it represents the successful attainment of a higher state, a realization of perfection. So this is known as the alchemic tree in Oxford. And of course you've heard the name of Sir Roger Penrose, um, uh, who's been in the news recently as uh, the Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he received half of the Nobel Prize um, uh, for his discovery related to black hole formation. Uh, he used um, ingenious uh, mathematical methods uh, to prove um, that uh, black hole formation uh, is um, uh, a direct prediction um, of uh, um, Albert Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. Uh, by the way, Einstein himself didn't believe in black holes. Um, and here we are on the Penrose um, paving or tiling uh, in front of the mathematics institution. So this is an amazing thing which Penrose did. Um, um, and. Uh, um, as you can see on the plaque, um, uh, the Penrose tiling actually defies our intuition about uh, infinite tilings of the plane with finite shapes. And Sir Roger Penrose was also a PhD examiner of Stephen Hawking. And uh, in his interview, uh, Penrose said that um, a contribution of Stephen Hawking uh, uh, to black uh, hole formation uh, uh, should also be credited. Um, the, the, many people think that Stephen Hawking um, is a Cambridge man, was a Cambridge man, uh, but uh, in reality he went to University College, um, uh, Oxford University, and um, uh, the story goes uh, that he didn't do very well in his final exams, um, perhaps because he didn't have enough sleep uh, before, and he was requested to do Viva, and uh, uh, when he was asked, uh, uh, what would you do if you get uh, first, he said, I would go to Cambridge, uh, because you needed a first to do PhD in cosmology. Um, he thought of himself apparently as a difficult and lazy student and perhaps thought that uh, it would encourage uh, the examiners to give him a better mark and he got it first in the end and the rest is history. I would like uh, to highlight an achievement um, done uh, by a female scholar of Oxford University. This is Mansfield College and uh, Jocelyn Belbernell uh, is an astrophysicist um, of Northern Irish origin, and when she was a postgraduate student, she was uh, the first to discover radio pulses. Um, it, she did it in uh, 1967, um, and the achievement was recognized uh, in 1974 by the award of the Nobel Prize. Um, however, she was um, n never a recipient of the Nobel Prize. It was not until um, uh, 2018 uh, that she was awarded the Special Breakthrough Prize um, in uh, Fundamental Physics um, and she decided uh, to donate uh, all the money, uh, around £2 million, um, pounds, uh, um, uh, to those young scholars uh, who are female, minority and refugees uh, uh, and who wish to study physics.
one of the world's greatest physicists was also here in Oxford, Trinity College. Henry Mosley, known as Harry Mosley, he used to work in Trinity Balliol, Balliol Trinity Chemistry Laboratory, which was one of the earliest chemistry laboratories um, in Oxford, uh, which uh, actually survived uh, um, uh, until the Second World War, when the physics um, laboratory was um, constructed um, in the science area. Uh, Henry Mosley uh, became known uh, uh, for uh, discovering the true basis of the periodic table, which enabled him to predict four new elements. Um, in 1913, uh, he used self-built equipment to prove that every element's identity is uniquely determined by the number of protons it has. He worked with Sir Ernest Rutherford um, uh, at the University of Manchester um, and um, uh, he was killed in Gallipoli in 1915. Um, uh, he uh, was so talented that Isaac Asimov uh, said that uh, Henry Mosley's death might have been the biggest single life loss uh, in the First World War. Uh, and even German newspapers commented um, about his death and loss to science. Um, in 1916, um, no Nobel Prize in Physics or Chemistry was awarded to anyone, uh, and uh, the general opinion was that it should have been awarded to Henry Monsley if only he could have stayed alive. Um, after this, um, the British government uh, was uh, lobbied and encouraged uh, uh, to put a ban uh, on uh, scientists to go into the front line. During the Second World War, Jesus College hosted secret atomic research codenamed um, the Tube Allies uh, Project. And the Tube Allies Program was the uh, first um, nuclear weapons uh, program in the world, um, uh, which uh, was initially done by Britain and Canada. Uh, the laboratory, which was uh, one of the earliest chemistry laboratories, uh, uh, opened in 1907 and closed in uh, uh, 1947. Uh, um, it was replaced by the Jesus College uh, Library facilities. Uh, uh, this is the building where students now um, go and uh, prepare for their studies. Um, Mm -hmm. One more library place related to the Second World War. The Western Library, which used to be known as the New Bodleian Library, um, in one of the reading rooms, um, uh, this is where a young naval intelligence officer, Jan Fleming, uh, was responsible for developing a D-Day project. Uh, and. Uh, you know that he became uh, later known for all the books about James Bond. So the British government decided not to send scientists to the front line anymore. Uh, Ian Fleming failed to bring the Enigma machine to the UK. Uh, and the Bletchley Park came into existence, uh, where Alan Turing later uh, broke uh, the code um, of the Enigma machine. Um, and why we are here in front of Kellogg College? This is because uh, the father of the current president of Kellogg College, um, he was a leading crypto analyst in Bletchley Park. Um, um, Donald Mitchie and Alan Turing often went to the local pub to play chess, not because they were both very good at chess, but they discussed how one might create a machine that could not only play chess, but could learn as it did so, which led in time to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And every year, Kellogg College has uh, uh, the Bletchley Park Week uh, and many events are also open to the public.
And finally, this is the Museum of History of Science in Oxford. Um, uh, this is known as the Older Schmollen Museum. It was opened in 1683 and it originally housed the collection of curiosities which belonged to the Tradescans and then to Ashmole. Uh, this is still the oldest uh, surviving first purpose-built museum in the world. Um, it was um, built um, to institutionalize uh, the new learning of science. Um, uh, and uh, it had a chemistry laboratory on the ground floor uh, and lectures and demonstrations uh, were held um, in the middle floor. Uh, so sort of public engagement uh, with science in those days happened here. Uh, the current collection has about 2,000, uh, 20,000 items and it has scientific instruments from all over the world uh, from antiquity uh, till the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, if you do have time, do come here to explore it in more detail because today we will be able to focus uh, on a few items. Oh, and now we are going inside uh, through this ceremonial entrance, not this one, a little bit further down. So this is one of the rare occasions when visitors um, are allowed through the ceremonial entrance. Actually, never ever in my life I've been through my, this entrance myself. So on the ground floor of the museum we are able to see Science and Sacrifice, a small exhibition devoted to Henry Mosley. A small exhibition about penicillin. And the hidden gem of the museum, which is Einstein's blackboard. Uh, so the, as the university's uh, the museum's website described it as a, a relic, um, belonging to a modern saint. So this is one of the blackboards um, from uh, the three lectures which Einstein gave at Oxford. Uh, so allegedly there were two um, collected after the lectures and, and uh, one of them was wiped out uh, by one of the staff members. But again, this is a sort of a legend uh, which uh, <laughs> no one knows whether it was true or not. Um, and uh, actually there is also a mistake in arithmetics and Einstein resisted um, his uh, lectures being published uh, by the Oxford University Press uh, and um, many years later he said that uh, um, since I delivered the lectures at Oxford um, I discovered uh, that most of the things uh, I've said were untrue. And Einstein was um, uh, visiting uh, a fellow at Christchurch College uh, and he stayed in the room where the graduate student room um, is at the moment uh, and on one of the walls uh, there are even copies of two poems which Einstein wrote uh, when residing at Christchurch. And if you go to Christchurch dining hall you can see his portrait in one of stained glasses. Another Christchurch association in the museum um, is uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, camera equipment. Um, Lewis Carroll was a mathematician and uh, he was a don in Christchurch, um, as uh, we all know. And uh, he became a very talented amateur photographer. And uh, the photos we have after the um, uh, Oxford University evolution debate from the Museum of Natural History were done by um, Lewis Carroll, or as he was known in the academic world, um, Charles Ludwig Dodson. Uh, and this camera set with chemicals used for photography production uh, has uh, in his initials uh, on top of them. Another treasure is 
camera which belonged to Lawrence of Arabia. T. Lawrence uh, was a student at Jesus College um, and uh, he uh, was also known um, as a diplomat, as an archaeologist and uh, he um, had many other roles but this is one of his original cameras which he used um, when he was uh, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. One of the most distinguished items uh, in the collection of the museum um, is Marconi's collection. It covers um, items uh, from the uh, very first demonstrations uh, of radio uh, towards uh, the beginning of the public uh, broadcasting in the UK. Uh, Marconi was known for his pioneering book on long-distance radio transmission and a radio telegraph system. He was the first inventor to be awarded a Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for practical application. And uh, actually, macronigrams, uh, macronigram messages were used when the Titanic um, uh, had um, a, its uh, disaster. Um, and, uh, um, they also say that he became famous also due to his mother's connections because his mother was Irish and she was uh, from the uh, Jameson whiskey family which gave him access uh, uh, to um, many high society circles in London. Um, when Marconi died, uh, all the radio stations um, all over the world uh, had a moment of silence. Marconi was also involved in the development of radar and uh, he was uh, the first to speak about the possibility of what we would now call a mobile phone. So now we are leaving what used to be chemistry laboratory and going to the adjacent room, which was um, a dissecting room. These holes on the floor, um, this is what remained uh, from the anatomy table. And the first um, anatomy laboratory was in Christchurch. This room now houses um, the largest uh, collection of astrolabes uh, and sundials um, and uh, some of uh, the items uh, around and on the upper floor. They belonged to Elizabeth I, um, um, Cardinal Wolsey and even Nostradamus. first um, English experimental scientist. Um, I would also like to finish with Isaac Newton, um, whose statue you can also find in the Oxford Museum of Natural History, together with the statue of uh, Roger Bacon. Um, when the Great Plague started um, at the end of the 17th century, all the students were sent home, both uh, in Oxford and Cambridge. And among them, there was a young Isaac Newton from Trinity College, Cambridge. He made a lot of scientific discoveries in self-isolation, um, and uh, that year became known as Newton's Year of Wonders. When he came back to Trinity College, uh, he completed his studies uh, within six months, became a fellow of Trinity College, uh, and within two years a professor. I wish you the coming months to be your months of wonders. Thank you so much again for being with me. I look forward to seeing you in real tours as soon as it becomes possible. Your guide in Oxford, Nina Kroglikova. Thank you so much again.